So good evening Castle Point. It's a pleasure to be here this evening, even if only virtually, to tell you about wild astronomy. So you can see from the top left, the subtitle effectively is Wildlife by Day, Stars by Night, and Sleep when you get home. So this is going to be a quite a lot of wild and a little bit of astro. Most of the astro comes at the end, so if you want to fall asleep for the first half of the talk, by all means do. So this idea for wild astronomy came because myself and a number of friends have common interests. Like most people in the room and on Zoom at the moment, a lot of us have an interest in astronomy. For some of us that might overlap with an interest in photography and hence astrophotography. But I find that quite a lot of people who are interested in astronomy are also interested in nature and that might include wildlife and possibly photography of wildlife. So you can see that all of these three areas, wildlife and astronomy and photography, do all overlap. Wildlife with binoculars, astronomy, sometimes naked eye, sometimes binoculars, sometimes telescopes, and photography can overlap both. So wild astronomy is really talking about the overlap of these three interests of mine and some friends of mine who also like to go where the skies are very dark to see wildlife. So I'm talking about going on safari. If you go on safari, you can go to exotic places where you can see wonderful animals. But also because you're going to somewhat more remote areas than perhaps are accessible in the UK, you get some wonderfully dark skies. So I'm talking about if you decide to try going on safari, where might you go? What would you need to take? I'll say a little bit about the sort of lodges and camps that we tend to stay at and some of which are suitable for dabbling with some astrophotography and others perhaps not so. I'll be talking about going on game drives. If you wish, you can just sit and let the animals come to you at a watering hole, or you can jump in a, a Jeep or a Savari van and go on a game drive to try and get as close to the animals as possible. I'll be talking about wildlife photography and showing a number of images that I've taken and also a few that my friends have taken as well. And then I'll be talking about how we can use the same camera that we would use for wildlife photography, use the same camera for doing astrophotography, because if we're going on safari in Africa, we'll be perhaps many hundreds of miles from the nearest streetlight. So going on safari, what do you need to think about when you go on safari? I am talking explicitly about safaris that I've been on and my friends have been on in Kenya and Tanzania, there in East Africa. So in Kenya, there's Nairobi, the capital of Kenya, and the largest city in Tanzania is Dar es Salaam on the coast. And my friends and I have visited various national parks and various sites within Kenya and within Tanzania. And the various images I'm going to be showing you quite often in the bottom left, I'll give an indication of what we're looking at and where the images were taken. So what do you need to take with you? Well, sunscreen is always a good idea. Uh, a hat is never a bad idea. Insect spray, well, unfortunately, yes, there are insects in Africa and it's a good idea to keep them at bay. Even if you do have insect spray, some of them might get through, so you still need to think about malaria tablets and perhaps some jabs as well to keep you nice and safe. Depending on where you're going and what you want to do, you might take an animal book or a bird book with you to check what particular species you're looking at. And a pair of binoculars is obviously not a bad idea. I tend to find 10 by 42s are pretty much optimal. I realize that slightly larger objectives might be better for astronomy, but if you're wearing a pair of binoculars around your neck for a lot of the day, you don't want them too big and too heavy. And I find that 10 by 42 is more than enough for animals and quite good for astronomy as well. And when it comes to camera, of course, that's a personal choice of whether you prefer DSLR cameras or mirrorless cameras or compact cameras, or perhaps you just like taking pictures with your mobile phone. If we go back 20 years or so, of course, we had the decision to make of how much film do you take? 
if you're going on safari for a couple of weeks, one roll of film clearly isn't enough, um, but do you need two or three or four or 20? And whatever you choose, it's generally never enough. You always find that you run out of film at some point. But of course, now that uh, we've gone digital for the last, not quite 10, 20 years or so, but something around the last two decades, we've had digital cameras. So we no longer have to try and guess how much photographic film we need to take with us. All we need is a modest collection of SD cards or perhaps one SD card. Given that you can get a terabyte on an SD card these days, I wouldn't want to put all my eggs in one basket, as it were, but given that one SD card can hold something like 100,000 high resolution images, you only need to take uh, two or three smaller cards to make sure that your entire safari is covered, regardless of whether you're taking animals or taking lots of raw images of astrophotography at night as well. So you arrive at the airport, there's usually chaos, but hopefully it's not too long before on arrival at Nairobi airport, you can get into a van and start driving off and your driver guide will take you to your first destination, your first camp or your first lodge. And normally it's not too many hours before that you finally get to the point where you can relax. So that might look something like the top right image where you might find a, a veranda over which uh, looking over a watering hole where you can sit and watch animals coming to you. Or you find the sort of view that you get on the left. It perhaps doesn't look very spectacular. And if you look, you can see a few zebras in the foreground. But this is fairly typical of a view in Africa in the sense that if you look, you can see some zebras. But then if you look a little bit further, you can see an elephant. And if you look a little further, you can see a giraffe. And if you look more, you can see another couple of elephants. And if you look further, you've got another giraffe and another elephant and another giraffe. In other words, the bush is absolutely full of wildlife in Kenya and in Tanzania. And sometimes at first glance, you may not see them, but with a little bit of patience, you realize that the bush is absolutely full of animals. And as long as you don't disturb them, as long as you're not too noisy, as long as you don't go revving the engine of your van or your Jeep and go charging into the bush, the animals will be, generally speaking, quite happy to drift their way towards you to give you a wonderful sight and a wonderful photo opportunity. If you don't like the idea of driving from A to B, well, you can fly. Not surprisingly, it's quicker to fly from one point to another in the, excuse me, in the bush, but it is a lot more expensive. So we did try that one year, but we can't afford to try that too often. But it was an interesting experience to fly and land at what you can just see in the distance there is a bush airfield. And the airfields are not particularly large. That's pretty much it. That's all there is at one of these international airports. The pilot normally has to overfly the airfield more than once just to clear it of any animals that happen to be just walking along the airfield. So the pilot literally has to fly once or twice over the airfield just to clear it of animals before finally coming in. So it's an interesting experience, but traveling by road is slower, but cheaper. So let's have a think about where you might want to stay if you do decide to go on safari. There are lots of options for lodges and camps, and many of them are on lakeside venues, uh, areas like this, for instance. Kenya and Tanzania are both part of the African Rift Valley system, the Great Rift Valley, and that has produced lots of faults in the rocks and lots of lakes have appeared. So there's lots of opportunities to either go into the more mountainous areas or to have lodges or camps that are alongside lakes like this one overlooking Lake Elementator. The lodges themselves, my friends and I are of an age where we don't really want to rough it too much. So we like to have a comfortable bed at the end of the day. Possibly after a few hours of stargazing, it's nice to have a nice comfortable bed with mosquito nets to make sure that you don't have to worry about mosquitoes um, in the, uh, at the dusk and dawn. And although you can't see it here, tucked around the corner is some Western 
sanitation, if you like. So in other words, we don't rough it. Everything is nice and clean and well catered for. Some lodges are positioned such that you have wonderful vistas like this one looking over the, the huge expanse of the Masai Mara. So out there, perhaps you can't see it on this image, but out there there could be very large numbers of wildebeest and zebra and antelope and the prey animals, the, the lions, the leopards, etc., the cheetah. One particular lodge that my friends and I rather like is this one where you can, if you wish, just sit on the veranda overlooking a watering hole. At this particular point, the picture was taken when there don't seem to be many animals at the watering hole, just a, a warthog and a couple of other small animals. But if you wish, if you're not particularly mobile, if you don't like bouncing around inside a vehicle, you could, if you wish, just spend the entire day sitting there watching the animals as they come for a drink. With a pair of binoculars or a relatively modest telephoto lens, you can easily see what's going on. So there is a contented man who is sitting there with his telephoto lens on the camera, pointing at the watering hole, binoculars round his neck, skimming through a bird book trying to identify the bird that he's just photographed. And as you can see from the bottom left, people will bring you coffee or perhaps a slightly stronger drink if that's your preference. So that's one way of spending quite a happy few hours. Here's a picture of that same watering hole taken shortly after sunrise, where there's a group of elands. These are relatively large antelopes that are fairly common throughout East Africa. And in this particular case, as you can see, because you're looking at the watering hole from a little distance, you get the wonderful effect of the reflections of the animals in the water. And you don't have to be restricted to taking pictures during the day because quite often these watering holes are lit at night. That doesn't worry the animals too much. Um, a floodlight over a watering hole, as far as an animal is concerned, it's pretty much just the same as having full moon. It doesn't really worry them. They are aware of the fact that they are illuminated, but then of course it makes predators easier to see, so they're a little more relaxed when they're drinking in the evening if there's a little bit of light around. And this is the first time I tried just to see what would happen if I tried taking a picture of the sky at this particular lodge, this same lodge in one of the uh, national parks of Kenya. So this was 2003, so I, I was still using film at the time. So this was slide film, I think it was ISO 200, and it was just a short exposure with the camera on a tripod, point at the sky, see what you get. So I'm not sure if anybody is familiar with this part of the sky, but down here we have the constellation of Scorpius, the classic S shape, which is difficult to see from England because we get that the sting in the tail is very low, depending on how south you are. I appreciate your, your latitude is a little bit further south than mine. Certainly in Scotland, it's very difficult to see. You can perhaps see most of the, uh, the, the S of the Scorpius. Um, and above that, we have the center of the Milky Way, but notice that because this is slide film and a relatively short exposure, it's very difficult to see anything in the Milky Way itself. We've really just got the brighter stars coming through. And of course, the stars have trailed slightly as it's a short exposure. It might have been a couple of minutes or so. And so the stars have trailed slightly. But I thought I'd give it a try simply because the the skies were so beautifully dark, I thought it's worth a try just to see how much we can capture. But I was always a little bit disappointed that slide film or indeed colour print film could never really capture what we could see with our eyes. This is a, a particular lodge uh, a little bit further to the east. Some lodges are basically built at ground level, some tented camps are built at ground level. As a little bit of a novelty, these rooms, uh, these lodges were actually on stilts to raise you up a little bit, gave you slightly more commanding views over the grasslands and the animals, and again another watering hole which wasn't too far away. Some lodges are deliberately positioned in photogenic areas. For instance, this one was actually 
positioned on the caldera of a huge crater called the Ngoro Ngoro Crater, not far from the Serengeti in Tanzania. And so all of the rooms had a beautiful view into the crater floor itself. The entire crater system is effectively an ecosystem in its own right, in that a lot of animals spend their entire lives within the crater and don't venture out by climbing up the walls that you can see on the left hand side there. Not all of Africa is dusty and arid, though it is often like that during drought periods. And of course, droughts come and go according to El Nino and other factors of global climate. But there are quite a number of areas, especially close to the main rivers, that are relatively lush as far as the, uh, the greenery is concerned, as you can see here in the grounds of one of the lodges on the Masai Mara. This is uh, a particular favourite of ours. This is called Altukai Lodge. This is in Amboseli National Park. It's at the southern end of Kenya, not far from the border with Tanzania. And these are the sort of uh, lodges, the sort of rooms that uh, you have. So if you wish, again, you can sit on the veranda and watch the animals at a distance, or you can walk through the grounds. The grounds are very nicely maintained and there's a huge amount of bird life so if it's birds rather than the four-legged animals that interest you you can spend a lot of your time simply walking through the grounds of the various lodges and pick up a lot of new bird species. This picture I show partly to give you an idea that perhaps there's a prevailing wind as you can see from these uh, trees. It's not quite as strong as these would indicate, but it does tend to be from the same direction. So over the years, the trees do sometimes conform to the prevailing wind. I'm showing this image not for the trees, but for the fact that on the right hand side, you might just be able to make out a few sticks in the distance here. That's the limit of the grounds themselves, and that's an electric fence. It doesn't look very substantial, but electric fences don't have to be. If they give the animal a little bit of a tickle when they rub up against it, it's enough to stop them coming any further. So it'll even stop an elephant, even though an elephant could, if it wished, blunder through the electric fence, they choose not to because uh, they're sensitive enough not to like the jolt they get from a few volts on the electric fence. But because this particular lodge has an electric fence, that means that you can go out at night quite safely and you can find yourself a patch of ground away from the trees and then you can take pictures of the night sky without worrying about whether you're going to be visited in the middle of the night. You still have lots of pairs of eyes in the distance. You often hear a lot of rustling and you look out into the distance and you shine a torch out there. You see a lot of eyes looking back at you, but most of those eyes belong to zebras rather than anything more dangerous. So this is one of the places that my friends and I tried a little bit of astrophotography. Again, this is dating back to 2003, and this is still with either slide film or color print film. And the exposures here were perhaps a couple of minutes on the right and perhaps five minutes or more on the left. And again, we're pointing at the centre of the Milky Way, the brightest part of the Milky Way, which is tricky to get uh, in its entirety from the UK because it is only low down in the south during the summer. Whereas from Kenya and Tanzania, close to the equator, the centre of the galaxy is much higher in the sky. So you can see with these short exposures, especially the one on the right, just a couple of minutes exposure, if we are in the right place at the right time, we can get a lot of the nice structure of the Milky Way coming out. So this might have been a slightly, slightly higher ISO film in order to pick out some of the details that we can see in the centre of the Milky Way itself, in the Pipe Nebula, in some clusters and in some Messier objects that we can pick out there. The one on the left, it's a little more difficult to see any detail in the Milky Way, simply because the five minute exposure, of course, has blurred. These are still cameras sitting on tripods fixed. And therefore, anything more than a minute or two will start to blur any information that there might have been inside the Milky Way. But this, again, back in 2003, was an indication that if we can get rid of the trailing of the stars, then it might be that astrophotography would produce some wonderful images 
in these very dark skies. You can see that the trees themselves, it looks like the entire area is floodlit. This is a little bit of an exaggeration. For safety's sake, some of the paths are lit so you can see where you're walking and some of that light does reflect into the trees, but the skies are genuinely dark. Some places are not so good for astrophotography, so some tented camps like this one. It's a wonderful area, a wonderful surrounding, but you can see from the amount of trees and foliage around your tent, it would be difficult to do any astrophotography from simply the veranda immediately outside your tent. You would have to walk somewhere else before you could think of doing astrophotography. And this particular place, it's called Governor's Camp. You might have heard of that because it's where Big Cat Diary was filmed by the BBC. This looks rather nice. It's a nice tented camp next to the Mara River. And you can see the tents here. They're dotted around the riverside. And although there are lots of trees, it's clear that there are some areas where it looks like um, they're clear of trees and you could, in principle, step outside and do some astrophotography. But we're told don't step outside your tent at night because that could be dangerous. This particular tented camp did not have electric fences. And so we were told it is dangerous to go out at night. Um, and perhaps we thought, well, are they just egging that up? Are they just saying that because it sounds more romantic? It sounds more dangerous than it really is. And they're just doing that because they want the tourists to feel like they're really in the wild. Well, I didn't dare go out at night after getting that warning. And the night afterwards, or rather the day afterwards, when I stepped outside my tent and had a look at the path just in front of the tent, I realised that there was a footprint there that wasn't there the day before. This, I am told by the experts, is the print of a lioness. Therefore, a lioness, or at least once, did walk through the camp at night. And so their warnings, do not go out and take pictures of the sky at night, were well heeded. If the experts say it is too dangerous, then it is too dangerous. No amount of astrophotography would make me want to go up against a lioness in the dark. The Rufiji River Camp is another tented camp, this time we're in Tanzania rather than in Kenya. It's next to the mighty Rufiji River and it's a tented camp. Again, animals can come through at night, but we were told that there's no big cats in this area. So if you wanted to take pictures at night, yes, you can go out with your camera and you can take pictures of the sky. Worst case scenario is some elephants will come through. So it's a good idea not to leave your camera on a tripod and then go back to your tent and come out 10 minutes later because you might find that your tripod is no longer there and it's been kicked down the way by a passing elephant. But as long as you stay close, the elephants will generally ignore people or move away from people. So if you wanted to go out with a camera, you can do so. So in this particular case, this is 2005. So now I had gone away from um, film to my first digital camera. So my first digital camera was a Nikon D70 and in 2005 I tried taking pictures of the sky to see if I could get any images that were better than the first images I took in 2003 from Kenya. And again you can see the stars have trailed because again we're taking short exposures. In this case because it's digital we have a record of what the exposures were. So this was two, two minute exposures, but still with a camera static on a tripod. But even with the same exposure, because this is now digital, we're picking up much more detail now in the Milky Way in even a two minute exposure. So again, we can see the dark dust lanes of the Milky Way. We can see the pipe nebula. We can see the star clusters and the various um, nebulae and star clusters are easier to pick out of an image like this compared to an image which was taken on slide film or print film. So I tried a few images from here in the Rufiji River Camp. Again, the centre of the Milky Way, the centre of the galaxy is somewhere about there. So we tend to see the part leading down to the centre and it's very difficult for us in the UK to, to see the part of the Milky Way that in this image is further to the right. And again, this time I 
took uh, a little bit further down. So this is the region of the Milky Way, which effectively we cannot see from the United Kingdom. So right in the center of this particular image, the two brightest stars here are Alpha and Beta Centauri. And over here we have the Southern Cross. It's quite small because this is a wide angle lens. And so uh, the Southern Cross is down here pointing at the South Pole, which is just off the, uh, the image. And the dark region just to the left of the Southern Cross, that's the Colsac Nebula. So this convinced me that digital photography has got great potential because in a relatively modest exposure of only a few minutes, it looks like you have the potential of picking up a huge amount of detail in a wide angle shot of the sky. But of course, we still have the problem if this is a static camera on a static tripod, we will always have the problem of the stars trailing. So it was about at this time, 2005, I thought, I need to do something about this. And so I decided to build myself a star tracker. And I'll say more about that a little later. So let's come away from astronomy and back to the wild. During the day, you have the option of going on game drives. That usually means jumping in a van or a Jeep or something and going out shortly after sunrise for an hour or two and perhaps another game drive later in the afternoon, perhaps an hour or two before sunset. The early morning and late afternoon are the best times to catch the animals, the heat of the day, that it'll drive them into the shade. And of course, at night they could be doing their hunting, so we tend not to disturb them at night. So my friends and I, with our driver David, second from the right there, had this safari van. The safari van is technically enough for six people, but my friends and I, generally speaking, if there's four of us, we find that a van that can take six is very comfortable for four because it gives you a few spare seats on which you can throw all your camera gear. That's very handy. And notice that we tend also to take pan and tilt heads with us. And if you simply clamp that to the side of the van, that means as well as simply hand holding a camera and pointing it at an animal, you have the option if the animal's in the distance and you need a little bit of steadying, you can very quickly with a quick release um, put the camera into the pan and tilt head and then you get a little bit of stability, assuming no one is jumping up and down on the van itself. So there's my friend Rob in the background and in the extreme background there's Mount Kilimanjaro. So we are in Kenya, Mount Kilimanjaro is in Tanzania, so that mountain is in a different country to where we are at the moment. 6,000 meters high there in Kilimanjaro. We're a few thousand meters above, above sea level at that particular point. But if you ask yourself, well, what sort of photographic gear do you need if you want to get nice and close to the animals, photographically speaking, but you don't want to get so close to the animals that you are going to disturb their behavior? What's the best sort of focal length to use? Do you really need a big telephoto lens if you want to go chasing animals? Well, you don't need something like that. Maybe that's the favorite for some individuals, and I know at least one person who bought themselves one of these telephoto lenses. Those people who want to take pictures of birds often go with relatively long focal lengths, mainly because birds generally are smaller than four-legged animals and quite often insist on staying in a very remote tree, which is perhaps hundreds of meters away from where you are and you can't always approach them without the birds flying off. So some birders do like to have large telephoto lenses. I have found over the years the best lens for me is a 300 millimeter lens. You can see it there. It's a Nikon 300 millimeter lens. I find that is ideal. Anything shorter you don't really need because you never get so close to an animal that you need a wide angle lens. If you want to take a wide angle view of the panorama that you're looking at, well, your phone has probably got a perfectly good camera in it. If you want to take pictures of animals, 300 millimeter means you can get nice close up images of animals without physically getting too close to them and disturbing them. So over the years, I found 300 mil is the sweet spot, long enough to get nice images, short enough that it doesn't take three people to carry it around for you. 
And to give you an idea of just how close you can get, there's a picture I took of a, a male lion who was doing nothing. That's what lions tend to do during the day. They just sit and sleep, given that they tend to hunt at night. So this particular male lion with his windswept mane pointing into the breeze there, to give you an idea of how close you might get before they get riled by your presence, that gives you an idea there. Um, somebody took a picture of my left ear and you can see that the animal is barely 10 or so meters away. Prey animals, sorry, predators, generally speaking, do not care about tourists. No animals prey on them if they're the top of the food chain and therefore they're really not fussed if a tourist happens to come within 10 meters or so of them. Prey animals that do worry about getting eaten by cheetahs or lions or hyenas or leopards, they will be a little more skittish and there you can't necessarily get to within 10 meters and it might be that you can only get to within 20 or 30 meters of them and that's where the 300 millimeter lens really comes into its own. Just to show how indifferent they can be, um, we were driving along the road, which you can see on the right, and just to the left of the road, there's a gully, and this leopard was just sitting in there and effectively just watched us go by. It realized that we were tourists. They've seen tourists before. They're not threatened by tourists, and tourists aren't food. Well, they aren't unless you actually leave the protection of the van that you're being driven in. But basically, these animals know what tourists are, and we leave them alone, and they leave us alone. If you've got a good driver guide, they will know about animal behavior. And there's no need to go chasing an animal that might walk away from you. A good driver guide will tell you, instead of following that animal, we're going to drive over here and then the animal will walk past us. And that's precisely what happened with a different encounter with a different leopard, where the driver guide positioned us such that a minute or two later after he switched his engine off, a leopard walked by within a few meters of us and we got a beautiful close up as this leopard, who again didn't care that we were there. It was just on the way to a watering hole to drink and it quite happily walked past us and allowed us to take the pictures. So I'll now show you a few wildlife photos just because this is a, a talk about wild astro and as well as taking the astrophotography at night we did a lot of wildlife photography by day. So let me show you some of our favourite images taken over a few years of safaris. It's sometimes difficult to realize just how many animals there are in Kenya. This was a panorama that I took and you can't really see what's going on. Even if I blow up the middle section, it's still a little bit difficult to see what's there. But basically we're looking at a huge herd of wildebeest with a few zebra and a few antelope and a few ostrich and a few others. But mainly this is the wildebeest migration where the wildebeest come up from Tanzania um, and then move through Kenya and then move back through Tanzania. It's a large cyclic movement of about a million or two million wildebeest and it happens every year as the wildebeest follow the grass and the grass follows the rains. So you can see that from any particular vantage point, being a scientist I tried to count how many wildebeest there are and I gave up after about a million or so. So I think within sight of our van at this particular spot there were something like a million wildebeest. And of course if you've got that many herbivores out there eating the grass then you're going to have predators that are on the lookout, whether those predators are crocodiles or lions or hyenas or other predator animals. The skies are also full at certain times of the year. This was a bit of a surprise. We went to a lake expecting to see flamingo, but instead we saw this. At first sight, they look a little bit like seagulls, but they are in fact pelicans, huge birds. And yet there was a flock of something like a thousand of them that took off as we approached a lake expecting to take a few nice pictures of flamingos. Instead, instead we were treated to something like a thousand pelicans wheeling above our heads. So many that I couldn't get them all in the photograph I took here. 
You have to remember that animals can be quite curious about us. They haven't necessarily seen that many tourists before. It depends on where you go. And so you often find that animals are quite curious as to what we're doing. Zebras might be a little skittish, but only if they think we're a threat and if we stay far enough away, that's not a problem. The little baby giraffe in the bottom left there, that might be the first tourist that it's ever seen. I'm not sure exactly how old it is. It's happy to stare at us and try and figure out what we are. As long as it stays close to mum, that's fine. If the mother doesn't panic, then there's no reason for the baby to panic just because something odd appears on the horizon and a few people inside are clicking away with cameras. In the bottom right, that mother is rather curious about what we're doing simply because she has cubs. And she's not worried about us, but she is, like all mothers, uh, protective of her cubs. And so the cubs in the grass there, she's making sure that we don't get too close for her comfort. This is the same lioness that we saw just a moment ago. The cubs are actually in the background there in the long grass and the lioness simply parked herself on this sort of dead bough, uh, literally to place herself in between her cubs and us, just to let us know that she was in charge and she didn't mind us taking pictures as long as we didn't get any closer. That was the sort of look in her eye that we got when she looked over her shoulder just to make sure we weren't misbehaving. Once her cubs had moved out of the long grass and were safe, she came off that bough and then walked along with them. Yes, sometimes the grass is quite lush and quite long. Yes, you can hide a baby, baby elephant in the grass sometimes. It can be not just centimetres high, the grass can be metres high depending on the time of year. It depends whether or not the wildebeest have already been through and cut it down to size as it were. So there are times when it's difficult to see some animals because the grass is literally so high you can't always see them. OK, in this particular case, it might be that the giraffe is lying down. I like to think of it as the giraffe actually standing up, but I don't think the grass is quite that high. So this giraffe is probably just lying down, taking a breather there. But most of the time, the grass is short enough that it's not a problem. This is more typical, depending on which grazing animals have already been through and had a nibble at the grass. And depending on what time of year you visit East Africa, you will often find the grass is, is like this, just centimetres or so high, which, of course, makes it easier to see animals of all sizes, um, from small antelopes all the way up to the larger ones. I like this particular shot just because this is a nice family picture of zebras doing what zebras do, which is basically eating. Eating with the exception that one always has the head up, just keeping an eye open for any predators on the horizon, while the rest of the family get on with the serious business of munching the grass. I like this picture partly because the sun that has risen just over the horizon on the left is just catching the seed heads of some of the grass there. So it just gives a, a lovely golden colour to this image. Let me show you a few of the individual animals. I'm not going to dwell too long on this, but it just gives you an idea of the variety of animals that you can see. My friends in particular are very much bird lovers. And of course, there's a huge number of birds in East Africa. And again, a 300 millimeter lens is ideal for capturing the detail in these birds and the beautiful colors. In the UK, we might have a starling. In East Africa, they have dozens of starlings of different sizes, different shapes, different colors. Virtually all of them have beautiful iridescent colors. Here's a few more starlings. I know the one in the middle looks a bit mean, but I think he's just waiting for some food. He knows that tourists sometimes have uh, sandwiches on them and occasionally a bit of breadcrumbs. So they have learnt that uh, tourists are good. Tourists means food. But most of the birds will just ignore you completely and they won't be too skittish. As long as you stay a few metres away from them, they're not too fussed about your presence. But again, these starlings, beautiful iridescent feathers. 
Just a small collection of some of the smaller birds that we photographed over the years. I've put the names down at the bottom. I'll make handouts available to you if anybody's genuinely interested in knowing which bird is which. I'll make these pictures available. But this is just an idea of the sort of selection of the types of birds and of course the beautiful colours that you get of the various birds. Some look like hummingbirds, we get sunbirds. The one in the top right looks very similar to the kingfisher that we would get in the UK. Again, we have a kingfisher in East Africa. They have lots of kingfishers in the kingfisher family. Bee eaters. This was taken from a river, so it's not quite as sharp as we would have liked, but occasionally the bee eaters do line up on a branch to make a very nice photogenic uh, family portrait. This is the lilac breasted roller. Effectively, it's the national bird of Kenya. It looks rather beautiful when it's sitting on a branch with the lilac and the light blue and the dark blue. It's arguably even more spectacular when it decides to fly because some of the flight feathers are an electric blue and it can be really spectacular when these birds fly in the sunlight. There are a few big birds. I'm sure you all recognise the ostrich in the top left and perhaps you recognise a cousin of our heron in the bottom right there. Some of these birds do have cousins in Europe which are similar to the birds of East Africa. Some are very specific to East Africa. We don't have anything quite like the hammercop on the left or the quarry bustard on the right. And in the middle there are secretary birds which are very large long-legged raptors or members of the raptor family. And there are lots of raptors around, whether they are buzzards or eagles or vultures. There are a huge number of raptors. And again, if you go out in the morning, the raptors will be picking up the thermals and circling, trying to get a little bit of lift. And sometimes the raptors will be circling just a few tens of meters above your head. And again, if you just stand still and follow them, you can get some beautiful close-ups. This is a, an auger buzzard in the main frame and a, a vulture in the inset there. I don't know if anybody can figure out what that is. I'll just wait a second to see if anybody would care to guess how this bird's head has exploded. It's just a question of which way the bird is looking. If it happens to be looking towards us, it looks like a normal eagle. It's probably an immature eagle. It looks rather small. And if, like owls, they can turn their heads through essentially 180 degrees either way, if it looks in the opposite direction, well, the feathers get a bit ruffled and it gives this rather odd view of looking like the head has exploded. But that's just the way the feathers are sitting. I mentioned earlier that Kenya has got a lot of lakes and Tanzania has got a lot of lakes because the Great Rift Valley runs through both country. So there's always water birds to be photographed. In the bottom left there, there's an African jacana on a huge set of lilies and you can always blow it up. That's the beauty of digital photography. You can blow things up and you don't have to worry about the grain of the slide film or the colour print film getting in the way when you blow images up. As long as they're nicely focused in the first place, you can blow them up quite substantially and still get very nice images. Of course, lakes means reflections. If you uh, like the idea of capturing a lot of water birds with their reflections, the opportunities on the lakes of uh, East Africa are many and varied. Again, a heron second from left, not too dissimilar with the sort of heron that we get in the UK. And again, cormorants we get in the UK as well. In this case, uh, a great cormorant. But it's not just the birds because there's always a lot of water around. Sometimes the animals give you beautiful reflections as well. The elephant on the left and the zebra on the right. Um, they just happen to be standing at the right place at the right time to catch a beautiful reflection in the water. The, the one in the middle might look a little bit odd because you look at the blue here and you look at the blue there and you think, well, if that's the water, how can that be the sky? Well, no, actually, they're both water. It just happens to be 
a patch a watering hole with a, a little bit of a green island in the middle. So here you have some water with ripples. It just so happens that here the water doesn't seem to have quite the same ripples, but we're still looking at a reflection of the sky. Uh, with this impala leaping across because it didn't seem to want to get its hooves wet when it went through this little damp patch in the middle. With lots of lakes there's lots of wildlife, not simply the water birds on the lake, but the lakes themselves support huge ecosystems, whether it be rhino, zebras, or on the left there, a beautiful water buck that decided to uh, allow its portrait to be snapped. Um, they can be a little bit skittish, so again, you can't get too close to them, and a 300 millimeter lens is beautiful for just capturing the animal at a distance. Given that animals uh, like lions don't do much during the day because they hunt at night, by day they either sleep, or in this case, these youngsters were just play fighting. But you do occasionally come across animals who are fighting for real. So here we have some vultures that are scrapping in the top left, some hippos having a go at each other in the top right, and similarly buffalo and hyena trying to steal a kill from a lion in the bottom right there. So animals will normally fight each other. Every once in a while they'll have a pop at you as well. If you get too close to a male lion, a male elephant, should I say, a male elephant might decide that he doesn't want you to be too close. They can be a little bit grumpy. And so they might chase you off, which is quite exciting, but not particularly dangerous, as long as your driver doesn't accidentally stall the engine as you're trying to make a getaway. There's a lot of serendipity when you're doing wildlife photography. So here I was photographing a crowned crane. This one was sitting, uh, sorry, standing in this, uh, this tall tree. And I noticed it from a distance, asked the driver to stop the van, got the 300 mil lined up on it. And just as I was about to take a picture of the static bird, its partner, presumably its mate, came up from behind and then uh, landed next to it. And when a big bird like that tries to slow down, out come the air brakes as it uh, opens up its wings to try and slow down to come to rest next to its partner. And I just got absolutely lucky that the wings of this crowned crane as it landed just sort of encapsulated, just framed, the other bird beautifully. And that's just pure luck of just happening to be in the right place at the right time. In the top right, one of my friends said, what's that in the tree in the distance? And we thought, well, maybe there is something in the tree in the distance, but it's probably not very interesting. It might be the leg of an antelope that was left there as a kill by a leopard. We got closer to take a look. Oh no, it is actually a lion. So yep, yeah, lions sometimes sleep on the ground. Sometimes they climb a tree. They get shade wherever they can. And every once in a while you find something again which you simply couldn't have predicted, like a cheetah decides to run up against the van and run at an, I don't know how fast, maybe it wasn't 60 miles an hour, but it was moving so fast that even um, when I was trying to pan and follow the cheetah, the shutter speed simply wasn't enough to capture it. It was simply too fast as it ran past the van and then disappeared off into the bush. Again, something else you cannot, you simply cannot plan for. Here we were expecting the zebras to be walking across a dusty plain because it was last time we visited this area. But for some reason, the underground water, the aquifer had changed and the entire area had flooded. It wasn't simply that they had had heavy rain recently, it was a change to the aquifer system. So instead of a large, flat, dusty bowl, it was now a shallow lake. And the zebras still want to walk from one place to another, regardless of whether it's now full of water. They still have their favourite paths that they want to follow. And as long as the flamingos don't get in their way, the zebras will just continue walking. So maybe you've had enough of animals. I can see the yawns from here. Even in Zoom land, I can see that you've had enough animals and you want to get back to the astrophotography. So of course, when the sun has set, that's usually when we finish uh, photographing the animals, but then that's when we start thinking about whether or not we want to get some astrophotography done. 
So, as I said earlier, having taken a few pictures of a camera with a camera on a static tripod, I decided what we need is to take some images with a tracker. So I built myself a star tracker, and that's it on the left-hand side there. It's a tracker that I built out of bits of aluminium and a couple of AA batteries and a potentiometer and a motor and a few resistors. If anybody's interested, I can make the details available if anybody wants to build a tracker for themselves. It would cost you about 20 quid, depending on what bits and pieces you already have lying around in your workshop or your garage or whatever. And I used this tracker for quite a few years. Uh, what was it? Between 2007 and 2013, I used this homemade tracker. It got a few inquiring looks when it went through airport x-rays, but generally speaking, it did its job. And a few years later, I decided to switch to a commercial tracker. I bought an iOptron. Lots of other trackers are available. I appreciate that. But this is one that I've been using for the last 10 years or so, the iOptron Sky Tracker. And the pictures I'm about to show were taken with either my do-it-yourself star tracker or the iOptron star tracker. It'll take a camera with a wide angle lens quite comfortably. I found that it'll take a camera with a 300 millimeter lens. That's the lens that I've been using on Safari. That same combination of camera and lens, exactly the same combination used for taking pictures of animals and taking pictures of the night sky. I didn't particularly want to take two sets of cameras and lenses with me. So if no one is familiar with the inside of a star tracker, that's basically what it looks like. It's basically just a motor in a box. Um, it might, it's usually battery driven, a little bit of electronics to control the speed of a motor, which goes through a gearbox, drives a worm gear, and that then drives this main gear at the rate of one revolution in 23 hours and 56 minutes, such that if you get the axis lined up with the Earth's axis, then you can uh, keep the stars nice and pin sharp. So this particular sky tracker comes with a little polar scope. It's nice that it's offset because no matter what you do to the camera, you can always double check by eyeballing that it's still lined up. And if you have an app, then it will tell you that Polaris should be positioned here. Um, the app on your phone will know through GPS where you are in the world, what the time is, and so will tell you where Polaris ought to be. That's fine in the UK. But if you're in East Africa, you have a problem because the North Celestial Pole, and Polaris, of course, is quite close to the North Celestial Pole, that's directly above the pole of the Earth. So if we're at latitude 50 something, then Polaris is nice and high in our sky, very easy to pick out, very easy to align our equatorial mount or our star tracker, whichever is our choice. But if you're in East Africa, you're effectively within a degree or two of the equator. And that means, as you can see from the red arrows, if you're on the equator, then the North Pole, or indeed the South Pole, are very close to the horizon. And Polaris will probably be hidden behind a hill or behind an elephant or something. And therefore you can't rely on lining up on the North Pole or the South Pole if you happen to be on the equator. You have to find a different way of lining up. Well, there are alternatives. You could say, well, I'll just use a compass to tell me which way is north and I'll figure out the tilt using a spirit level or something like that. Well, true, but bear in mind, magnetic north is not the same as true north. OK, you can look that up. That's fair enough. But you do have to be aware of the fact that a compass needle will be affected by nearby metal and nearby motors. For instance, those found in a motorized star tracker. So what you can't do is put a compass on top of a star tracker and expect it to accurately to give you north. It'll give you roughly north, but in principle, the, the compass would need to be separated quite a bit from the star tracker to give you a genuine north. And if it's separated from the star tracker, then how do you make sure the star tracker is pointing at the same thing that your compass needle is pointing at? So it's not ideal to use a compass. So for a few years, I used an alternative means of making sure that I was pointing north, even if I couldn't find Polaris. So this is what the north sky might look like if you are a couple of degrees south of the equator. So notice that Polaris is not visible. Polaris is just below the horizon. 
close to where the N of the North symbol is sitting. And I'm sure you all recognise the, the plough there. What you can do before you leave home, you know roughly what days you are going to be on holiday, you know what days you might be doing some astrophotography. So all you need to do is to look at your planetarium app and say, right, I will look up when that particular star is due north, for instance. And also I will make a note when that star is due north. And I'll make a note when that star is due north. In other words, you can make a note of the transit times of a few stars which are easy to pick out of the sky, depending on what time of year you decide to go on holiday. Then all you need to do is to say, well, I know that that star is absolutely due north at 10 minutes past nine. And it's now five minutes past nine. Therefore, I will wait five minutes. And then I know that if I point at that star, I know that I'm pointing north then all I have to do is to get the altitude right, which is a question of using a spirit level or something like that. So there are ways of doing it, even if you haven't got a line of sight to Polaris. And that's how we came up with some rather nice images. I'm going to show you a few taken by my friend Rob and a few taken by myself. This again gives you an idea of the nice dark skies. Yes, the trees do appear as if they are floodlit. They're not being lit, they're just picking up some of the light because the paths have to be lit for safety reasons. Uh, the equivalent, not quite the equivalent of red light, but the light is pointing down. Some of that is being picked up by the tree in this, uh, in this exposure. But the sky, um, the amount of sky pollution is effectively zero. There's no need for any thought of filters in order to get long exposures without worrying about the glow of the sky itself. So I tried a number of different things. Uh, for instance, I had with me an 85 millimeter lens. This is one exception to the 300 millimeter rule in the sense that uh, although I had a 300 millimeter and a wide angle, one year I took with me an 85 millimeter lens just to see what I could get. In this particular case, um, it was at a time of year when the large Magellanic cloud was above the horizon. Um, one advantage of being on the equator is that effectively you can see the entire sky from North Pole to South Pole. And as the night progresses, the whole of the sky rotates round. But it does mean that, for instance, the large and small Magellanic clouds, which are quite close to the South Pole, they are never very high above the horizon. If you want to get the best images of those, you go to South America or Australia to get the best images, or perhaps South Africa to get the best images of the large and small Magellanic cloud. So this was not many degrees above the horizon, but I thought I'd try and capture the large Magellanic cloud with an 85 millimeter lens. And typically I take perhaps one or two minute exposures with the tracker. Um, it can run for longer than that. The exposures could be longer without the stars trailing but there's no particular advantage to taking longer exposures. So in this case, it was 30 exposures, each of which was 60 seconds to get the Magellanic Cloud. I tried some wide angle shots. So here we've gone to a 35 millimeter lens and I've mosaiced a few of the images together. So again, this is part of the Milky Way that can't be seen from the United Kingdom. So we've got Alpha Centauri and Beta Centauri over on the left there. In the middle, we've got Crux, the Southern Cross, pointing down towards the South Pole, which is off the bottom end of this particular image. Uh, that's the jewel box cluster on the left hand side of the of the Southern Cross and the large dark area in the corner there. That's the Colsac Nebula. Further over to the right, we've got uh, Lambda Centauri, a nebulosity region there. And the rather spectacular nebula over on the right hand side is Eta Carina or Eta Carinae nebulae, a very unstable star that seems to be shrugging off a huge amount of matter and is a, perhaps a candidate for the next star to go supernova that we would be able to see. I, I thought this was quite nice with a 35 millimeter lens, so again I tried. Uh, uh, in a different year, taking an 85 millimeter lens just to see if I could get more detail in that nebula. 
and it's picked up the uh, the Southern Pleiades, a rather nice uh, set of uh, a rather nice cluster of stars there that are very blue in colour, with a few red stars mixed in there. But I was very pleased with the amount of detail that I could pick up with an 85 millimetre lens in the Eta Carina Nebula itself. Eta Carina is the star which is just where the arrow is pointing in the brightest part of the nebula but you can see that the structure of the nebula is very complex because of the amount of matter that this star has been ejecting for many thousands of years now. And it's a reminder that an 85mm lens, of course, is not a particularly long focal length. It reminds you that some of these nebula are very large in the sky. This is a little bit of a crop from the original full image, but not by that much. So it's a reminder that um, if I had used a 300mm lens, for instance, it would be uh, almost overfilling the frame. The Milky Way itself, here I've tried to just give an impression of what you might see of the Milky Way from the United Kingdom. If you've got a nice dark sky, you'll be able to see the Milky Way crossing the sky, and you might be able to see a little bit of detail in some of the dust lanes. But let me show you what it looks more like with the naked eye when you're in Africa. By, with the naked eye, you can see a huge amount of detail in all of the dusty structure throughout the Milky Way, throughout the fainter parts as well as the brighter part of the Milky Way, with the centre of the galaxy being roughly where the cursor is indicating there, and various nebula visible, which I'll come back to shortly. But this gives you an idea. That's as close as I can get to an indication of what the Milky Way actually looks like by eye. It's bright enough that it is absolutely stunning when you see it and you've got away from any sort of uh, lighting, any sort of light pollution. Of course, if you take an image, you not only capture all that detail that you can see with the naked eye, but of course you also get the colour coming in as well. So this, as you can probably tell from the corners, is actually a mosaic. It was again taken with a 35mm lens, and it's a mosaic of more than one pane in order to cover a reasonably large chunk of the, the Milky Way running from, in this particular case, I think it's running from about Aquila through Scorpius. So Scorpius is sitting down here. There's the sting in the tail and there's the S of Scorpius and there's Antares and the claws of the scorpion are over here on the right. But remember, compared to what I showed you a little while ago, the first image I took of Scorpius from a dark sky site um, with a film camera, well, with that, I could see the stars clearly enough, but I could barely make out anything of the Milky Way. Now it's exactly the opposite. Now with exposure of a few minutes with a digital camera, I get an enormous amount of detail in the Milky Way and there's so many faint stars, it's actually difficult to see the brighter stars. So if I point out where Scorpius is in that image, there it is. And you can see the scale isn't quite the same, but you notice that you can barely see the bright stars of Scorpius just because of all of the fainter stars that are now being picked up in a long exposure of the Milky Way. And we can see so much more, partly because it's tracked and the exposure is longer, partly because it's now digital. So it, this is just a crop from the central region of that Milky Way that I was just showing you. There's Jupiter and Saturn. This was in 2019 when Jupiter was still fairly close to the centre of the galaxy and Saturn was a little bit further over. There are lots of star clusters and nebulae in the image and you can spend ages if you've taken an image like this going through it and trying to pick out, ah, well, that must be, uh, yeah, that must be M17, that must be M16. Yeah, we've got the Lagoon and we've got the Triffid, etc. And you can label all of them. I haven't even attempted to label the NGC because there are just far too many of them. So we've got all of the M numbers down to M6 and M7, effectively the furthest south. It looks like there's no interesting clusters or nebulae or anything else south of that line. That, of course, is an artefact that simply tells us that Messier could only see that far. As seen from France, he couldn't see any interesting clusters further south than the yellow line. But, of course, the interesting 
content of the Milky Way, the interesting nebula, the interesting clusters will continue, even though we haven't picked them out with our M numbers. I thought it's nice to get a wide angle, it's nice to get the whole thing, but is it worth trying just to see what we would get if we went with a slightly longer focal length? So in the red box there, there's the Lagoon Nebula and the Triffid Nebula. And there's a hint of colour in both of them, but they're a little difficult to see if they're so small. So I switched from the wide angle lens to the telephoto lens. So I used my 300 millimeter lens, the lens of choice for animals. I thought, how well will it do as an astrophotography lens in this situation? So I switched to the 300 and took uh, an image. Uh, I had already spent quite a bit of the night imaging wide angle. So this image you can see on the right of M8 and M20 is a single 30 second exposure. So this is not taking lots of images and stacking them together. It's a single 30 second exposure. I think actually that one is probably no dark, no flat, just a straight one frame, 30 seconds. Let's see what we get. And you can see that you get a nice bit of pink in the Lagoon Nebula, quite a bit of structure in there. And I was quite pleased to see that the colours of the Triffid Nebula came out as well. It doesn't stand a great deal of magnification. If I blow it up and take that, you can see that the stars don't look particularly pin sharp because I've taken a relatively small crop of the image. But you can see the pink and the blue of the Triffid and the Triffid lobes themselves do come out. And I was happy that a single 30 second exposure, I was quite happy that I could pick out the colours and some of the structure in that sort of image. So I think the take home message of wild astronomy is photographing wildlife can be enormously rewarding. If you're going to go anywhere where you're looking for either landscapes or animals and you're going anywhere where you're going somewhere that's relatively dark, Think about packing a little star tracker. They don't weigh much. They don't take up much volume. Uh, you can build one yourself for 20 quid and they weigh probably less than a kilogram or so. And it doesn't add much to your luggage, but it makes an enormous difference to the potential for astrophotography if you're going to visit some part of the world in which you're going to experience beautifully dark skies. So that's my take on wild astronomy. And that, as they say, is the end. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Steve.